This video is brought to you by my supporters over at my Patreon, as well as your local public library. I'm not sponsored by them, it's just where I get a lot of my research material from. She had a rendezvous with a great white shark that was trying to kill her family off. She knew somehow that he awaited her in deep ocean waters. She was going to kill the shark before it destroyed her and her family. Kill him or die herself. Hi, I'm C.V. Smith, and we're going to be talking about Jaws 4, The Revenge, both the movie and the novelization that goes with it. Summertime may be over, but Shark Month... Shark Month is forever. Go and shed your winter coat, go and put your life vest on, when you go to the sea you'll see a cuddly 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 shark, cuddly cuddly cuddly, 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 cuddly shark. shark. Hank Sales has been a novelist and screenwriter since the 1960s, with several original works adapted to the big screen. While not stuck with just one type of story, Hank did write several works about people out at sea and the animals in it, including one about an old sperm whale making friends with the sailors on board a Soviet Union submarine. So it makes sense for him to be the one hired to write the novelizations to both Shark 2 and 4, but not 3. For the surprising to me large amount of people I know that have never seen Jaws and, well, the even smaller amount of you that would click this video, the first Jaws book and movie tell the story of a small New England island terrorized by a large great white shark. In the sequel, another great white returns to the island to wreak havoc. And the third one? According to the fourth one, there is no third one. It never got a novelization and The Revenge, both book and movie, never mentions the events in it at all making it the red-headed stepchild of the Jaw series. As a fellow red-headed stepchild myself, I can relate. One of the interesting things about the setup for this novelization is because Hank Sales wrote the second movie's novelization, he incorporates aspects from that book into this one, as well as making parts of Peter Benchley's original Jaws book that were left out of the original movie back into the series, making Jaws the Revenge both a novelization of the movie as well as an unauthorized sequel to the original novel. Couple problems with that though. I won't talk about Benji's original novel for long, but to put it one way, the original novel is a lot more mean-spirited than the movie it turned into. One of the aspects that changed was Ellen Brody, from an unfulfilled, bored housewife that cheats on her husband, unaffected by the shark attacks and the threat to the town, to a faithful wife and devoted mother that is affected by the shark attacks like everyone else in town. Yeah, so with this novel added back in, she's now both, and I don't know how to feel about that. On the one hand, it adds depth to the character, not everyone's perfect, but on the other hand, the justification given makes Ellen out to be... mean. Her love for Marty dawned slowly. Her passion for Hooper, back at the time of the first troubles, she'd taken Hooper in anger, and Marty's bullheaded dedication to the town and to the job. Like, damn, Ellen, that's pretty cold. While the first two movies in the series took place in the summer at Amity, with Chief of Police Martin Brody being the one that killed both sharks, in The Revenge, both movie and book, it begins in winter at Amity Island, where Ellen, now widow to Chief Brody, will be having a small but enjoyable Christmas with her son Sean, the new Chief of Police. In Seal's novel, there's a throwaway line that suggests that this shark has a connection to the Brody family. He was near waters in which he'd been conceived, sired by a male almost as big as he. His mother, enormous, gravid with young, had swept Amity Sound like death itself, bearing him, three sisters, and another brother. So our shark is probably the offspring of both sharks that were killed in the first two movies. Is that why it's called The Revenge? I mean, the story taking place around Christmas kind of makes sense, though? Christmas time is a time of families coming together to celebrate life and togetherness. Traditions dating back before Christianity to mark the winter solstice, the time of year in the northern hemisphere where the night is the longest. Historians speculate that a reason for the exchanging of gifts and big family feasts is that winter was a time of difficulty. Food will become more scarce and many people will not make it till spring. 
a time when kings froze to death in their castles, same as the shepherds in their huts. So cultures through the northern hemisphere would celebrate life one last time before the time of surviving the cold. Poor sweet summer children, i.e. modern people, to forget that winter is a harsh time, thanks to modern things like, well, central heating. So it makes sense to have the setting of Jaws for the revenge being around the winter solstice. Here is a story about a shark, a force of nature, here reminding us, reminding mankind, that winter isn't just coming, it's here, with a vengeance. Or the studio just told the filmmakers in September that they have nine months to make a movie, and the place they filmed the first two movies, Martha's Vineyard, already set up their Christmas decorations. I like my version better. Just for comparisons, the other movies were given about two years to be made. Fun fact, that's around the same time for the gestation period of a great white shark inside of their mom which the novel goes into a little detail explaining for our vengeful shark monster. But Sean is killed by the shark, and honestly a pretty gruesome way, which brings Mike, the other Brody son, to come for the funeral with his wife Carla and daughter Thea. The movie skips over Ellen in a fit of grief, fires a pistol into the water. If there's one unironic positive thing about Jaws the Revenge is how the movie handles grief. Laughing one minute, then crying the next, pretending to have fun when literally everyone around you knows you're not okay. The movie with a roaring shark is really good at expressing grief over a dead loved one, including attaching a bunch of random coincidental tragedies together as a coping mechanism. And while the movie chalks up her husband's killing to fear of the shark, Dad died from a heart attack. He died from fear. The fear of it killed him. Oh. The novel explains that after the ending of Jaws 2, Martin Brody's heart was old and weak, resulting in a heart attack before the events of Jaws 4. This combined with Sean's death, it would only make sense for someone to latch on to the concept of sharks killing off her family. Throughout the whole movie now, Ellen is overprotective of her son and granddaughter, seeing sharks in artwork, nightmares that she'll be next, Jaws the Revenge is the story of an elderly widow coping with loss and is now seeking revenge on the manifestation of that loss with the shark. Come on, you can't believe that voodoo. Well, this is a book channel. Reading too much into something is kind of what I do. Michael decides to take Ellen back with him to the Bahamas, specifically Nassau, the capital. In the book, the town is called Prince Georgetown, which does not exist. In Nassau, there is Prince George Wharf, but... That's about it. Something else follows Ellen and the Brody family from Amity as well. On this hungry morning, impelled by a savage whim, he turned and headed south. We're gonna find out what exactly that savage whim is later. The movie has the shark just keep swimming along to the island, but in the book, while traveling all 1,088 miles, he eats some seals and a squid and gets into a fight with a f***ing sperm whale and wins! This shark is not kidding around. At the island, the rest of the cast is introduced, like Hoagie Newcomb, the pilot flying the Brodies in. We don't know much about Hoagie in the movie, and the mystery around him is revealed further into the novel. We learn a bit about his time in the Royal Air Force and some time in the Falkland Wars, a two-month skirmish with Argentina and the UK over territory in the South Georgia and Sandwich Islands. Sandwich Islands, Hoagie Newcomb. Sandwich Islands, Hoagie Newcomb. More is revealed about Hoagie later on, but already in the beginning of the novel there was an assassination attempt on this Sandwich Island veteran. Yeah, I can't think of a good joke no matter how I slice it. Even that one was subpar. Another character is Jake McKay. Jake is Mike's partner in their oceanic research on conch shells. In the movie, Jake is a lively, easygoing friend, but in the book, some issues start to skim up to the surface. The Bahamian government is giving Mike grant money for his conch research, as well as donating money to his wife Carla to create a piece of artwork for the island to be displayed. Peter Benchley's original Jaws novel had this back and forth about locals versus tourists and summertime residents of Amity Island. In this novel, Jake brings up the racial angle about a white dude's family from the US receiving government funds for research when, well, like Jake's existence is showing, there are local researchers. It's a wedge that is brought up a couple times in the novel, but never at all in the movie. 
And speaking of things that were never brought up into the movie, in the movie, there's a small scene in a casino on the island. While it doesn't go anywhere in the movie, in the novel, it actually plays into a major subplot as the Latino Mafia headquarters in the Bahamas. That assassination attempt on Hoagie was part of a series of attacks on him as Hoagie is believed to be a rival smuggler and money launderer to the novel's human villain, Rico Lomez. Rico was a soccer player turned Latino Mafia Don who soccers drugs to the island from his casino. Soccer pun. I know my sport balls. Yeah. Rico knows that Hoagie is running an operation under his nose that's putting a dent in his business. Hoagie even has a nickname among Rico's gang, El Corneo Grande, the big rabbit. So throughout the book, Rico is trying to have Hoagie killed, first in the beginning with being shot in a car, then shot while flying his plane. Hoagie is a wily wabbit indeed. While making an emergency landing on that shot plane, Hoagie sees a shark in the water. Remember that? There's a shark in this Jaws sequel occasionally. And at one point, the shark ends up being used by the mob to kill the person that failed to kill Hoagie in the beginning of the novel. Not like Rico gave the shark money to kill the guy, just the shark was swimming by and chomped on the man tied up on a jet ski. The only time this drug war side plot is brought up in the movie is Mike's suspicion about Hoagie and Hoagie's response on what he does for a living besides flying planes. What do you do when you're not flying people? I deliver laundry. But at the same time this is going on, Ellen's granddaughter Thea is puking. She's getting sick. Is it a cold? A fever? A voodoo curse? Oh yeah, I forgot that in this book there's a voodoo witch doctor. A voodoo witch doctor. Come on, can't believe that voodoo. A voodoo witch doctor. Voodoo magic. Fucking voodoo magic, man. <laughs> Jaws 4 has a fucking voodoo witch doctor. Now what are you doing here? What, what, what do you want? Why, why, why are you all up in the voodoo ritual space? The last major addition in a whole series of major additions the novelization did in Jaws the Revenge, Papa Jacques. He's introduced as a passenger in Hoagie's plane that Ellen comes to the island in. Jacques has a beef with Mike Brody. It's never explained exactly what it is outside of Mike doesn't believe in that voodoo, but over the course of the novel, he very much will believe in that voodoo and the who's that do the voo-do. Supernatural incidents start happening in the novel that either directly or indirectly have Jacques involved. Carla, Mike's wife, is having a crisis with her art, exclaiming that the metal used in the sculpture is evil. Thea is possessed, but with a snake spirit, not a shark spirit, nah. Shark possession won't happen until Ghost Shark in 2013. I wonder if there's a ghost shark novelization. It's at this point Ellen and Thea are put into a trance and walk into the ocean for the shark, who I also think is possessed at this point too, to come eat them at the same time. Mike is put into a trance to drink chicken's blood from Thea's stolen sandcastle bucket, cause voodoo curse, I guess? The Brody family is saved by Jake's girlfriend, Louisa, who performs an exorcism and protection spell on the Brodies. Right, so Louisa is a good voodoo priestess and possibly descendant from fairies, too. She also doubles as a blackjack dealer in that mob-run casino. Y'all remember the mob part in this story? Throughout the movie, there are scenes of the shark attacking Mike and his boat during his conch research. It's treated as just a weird coincidence. Great whites have been spotted in the northern part of the Bahamas, but pretty rarely. One of these scenes involves Mike maneuvering inside a ship, and just... Uh, how is that thing fitting inside there. During one of these attacks, the shark is tagged so it can be tracked by its heartbeat. According to Jake in the novel, Jacques put a charm on the boat and Mike is starting to believe in that voodoo, so in the words of Mike, the shark has him tagged too. The plot thickens. Word gets around about the shark and it's decided the beaches can't be closed down because of the Junkanoo Festival, a real celebration in the Caribbean and other places that takes place after Christmas. It appears once early in the movie, and in the novel, it plays an integral part of the island's economy. No beaches, no junk anew, no money for the island. A shark threatening the livelihood of community, featuring the mafia. Why does that sound familiar? 
The first Jaws book also had a Mafia subplot scrapped from the first movie. The novelization to Jaws of Revenge also brings this back from the first book, including a scene of cat murder, Miley's favorite kind of murder. And if you have a favorite kind of murder, let me know in the com- You know what? No. No. I'm not doing that bit. That's a weird bit. The problem with this Mafia story in Jaws of Revenge is it's completely separate from the conflict with the shark. Last year, I was guesting over at the Movie Dumpster YouTube channel talking about the novel Razorback. And while the movie focused on just this giant boar and its effect on a handful of characters, the novel is this big tome of a book incorporating an international diamond smuggling ring operating in the Australian outback, New York City, Hawaii, and Hong Kong. And occasionally there's a Razorback in the story. In the first Jaws novel, it's the shark that connects the other storylines together. The shark threatens the beaches, which threatens the economy, which threatens the mob real estate deal. The shark brings a character that Ellen has an affair with. It's all connected. In the revenge, not so much. Hoagie's drug dealings could be its own story without the shark. And I wish it did, because in the case of Jaws the Revenge, you don't need a bigger boat. Book. The joke was book. The shark storyline does come together with the Mafia storyline at the end. You see, Hoagie isn't a rival drug dealer. He's actually working with the DEA to take down Rico as part of his own personal revenge on the death of his daughter after an overdose on Rico's heroin. Rico escapes the raid, then holds Hoagie, Mike, and Jake hostage inside Hoagie's plane, resulting in a struggle for Rico's gun. Rico is thrown out of the plane and eaten by the shark. Then, Jake is eaten, but not before getting a transmitter into the shark. Which brings us to the thing the movie is most famous for, the roar. Honestly, with everything else that I've talked about, voodoo curses, toddlers possessed by snake spirits, blackjack dealers descended from fairies, I am okay with a roaring shark. I've seen the abyss, and it stared back. Stared back with a row of rubber teeth with black eyes dead eyes like like a doll's eyes and probably because it was also made of plastic and exploding in my face i deserve it i deserve it all The original ending wasn't meant to be an explosion, but a stabbing. The novel has the original stab ending. Papa Jacques, possessing the shark, also feels the stab. He dies, along with the shark. The revenge has been avenged. Ellen and Hoagie in the novel fly off into the sunset with movie Ellen going back to Amity. The end. So between the shark avenging against the Brodies and his family, Ellen avenging the death of her family on the shark, uh, Papa Jacques seeking revenge on Mike, and Hoagie avenging for his daughter against the mob, I guess the real revenge of Jaws the Revenge are the friends we made along the way. I wish I could say this was a so bad it's good read. So many scenes happen so fast you have a hard time figuring out what's happening in each scene, which is why I ended up just listing things happening in the video. I didn't even mention the movie executive addicted to Coca-Cola, the windsurfer racing against the shark, or the flashback of Mike remembering a baby seal taking a sh** on his lap. Everything about this book screams first draft. The page count is roughly the same as the original Jaws novel, but crams like three more subplots than Benchy's original book. And I'm not faulting seals really. The script was being made and remade so much, filming started without the first draft even written all the way through. It's no wonder the book ended up so different to the finished movie and so bloated. So much is thrown at you to the point I can't even appreciate the goofiness that is Voodoo Shark. Lucky for us, there is a place that we all can believe in that voodoo shark. The Discovery Channel. The Rogan Phantom. The Voodoo Shark. Voodoo shark. A Voodoo Shark. Some people call it the Voodoo Shark. An alligator? No. Shark. This is CB Smith, and thanks for taking a page. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching. This video and others on this channel wouldn't be how they are without help from my supporters over at patreon.com forward slash CB Smith taking a page. Those who sign up receive early access to my videos as well as other little extras like behind the scenes, question polls, and automatic entrance to my book giveaways. For a second, I'd like to thank the ones who've signed up. Thanks guys. 
Ken Smith, Joe Lascola Jr., Patrick Carrico, Sean O'Rourke. Hope to see everyone in the next video, and as always, take care.